Hello, hello everyone. It's me, Arden Lee. I am back today with another video and today's video has tended to be a fairly hot button topic in the past. So I will put that out there as a warning. Um, we're going to be talking today about, <laughs> I'm going to be talking today about where the line is between victim blaming yourself and taking responsibility for changing your outcome in the future. Now, I wanna make something incredibly clear. I say this, I offer this as a teaching, um, not to make anyone feel bad about anything that has happened to them, but merely to share the tools that I learned for myself to bring my own life and my own circumstances into a better place. I am someone who has experienced more sexual assault than I can possibly count. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's a uh, it's a whole uh, a whole history there, and uh, I went from having sexual assaults happen to me, you know, at times more than once a week, even um, to where I am now, and in that place, uh, I have not had. Uh, an assault of that nature happened to me in over a year and a half. So I will offer that. And um, even though um, even though the idea that there is something that we can take our power over to uh, to start controlling more and more of what happens to us in our field, in our environment, um, based largely sometimes on the environments that we choose for ourselves, um, I don't want to be so afraid of being criticized for this sort sense of teaching a sense of um, calling that sovereignty and that power back, um, being mistaken for victim blaming, that I fail to offer this as a resource to people who are looking to put themselves in better circumstances in their lives. Um, so there you have it. So I'm just going to be brave and I'm just going to go ahead and, uh, and make this video. Um, and I want to, I want of course to make very clear distinctions, um, around, uh, uh, around how this can be utilized in a way that does not focus blame on the survivor for what happened to them while still empowering them to make choices about their future. So, Hopefully that will come across clearly before, of course, I get into that topic. I know that was a long introduction, but um, but I don't want to skip this part <laughs> before I get into that. Of course, as always, I'd love to invite you to subscribe to my channel and or like my page, depending on what platform you are viewing this on. And uh, also, uh, if you're not yet familiar with me or my work, my name is Arden Lee and I am the creator of the Repatterning Project, which is an eight week course. Uh, where we hack our beliefs, examine our patterns, and we go through and bring conscious awareness to all of the choices that we're making on a daily basis so that we can make the choices that optimize our paths toward happiness, success, personal growth, abundance, wealth, all the goals that we have in mind for ourselves. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and check out the links in the description box where uh, I have linked to a free PDF guide about the repatterning project in case that's something that you're interested in. And also uh, I have a link to the repatterning parlor, which is the free group that I moderate on Facebook full of like-minded individuals who are all waiting to welcome you into the fold <laughs> um, to, uh, to also start doing this, uh, doing this work, bringing awareness to, uh, uh, to the work with uh, supportive individuals um, surrounding you in that community. So, um, so yeah, so I hope those are helpful. Go check them out. And now let's get into this um, very difficult hot button topic. I feel a little bit like I'm diffusing a bomb uh, when, I, when I address this kind of thing, because of course, I don't want to make anyone feel bad, uh, but I do want to give uh, I do want to give people tools to be able to uh, facilitate their reality uh, uh, to a to a greater extent. So, what I learned for myself <laughs> when I started doing this work, um, the the way that I the realization that I had that really helped me to call my power back to myself. Uh, in terms of what I was calling into my field, what I was creating in my reality, um, was when I read a passage from Bessel van der Kolk's 
book, The Body Keeps the Score. Uh, I read The Body Keeps the Score and I discovered, discovered something called the ACE test. The ACE test is A-C-E and it stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And full disclaimer, the ACE test as it stands now is I think something that is an incomplete tool. I think it has about 10 questions on it and um, there are certainly many more questions that could be asked, but it is a good place to start. Uh, and basically it asks you a bunch of questions about uh, whether you've had certain adverse experiences happen to you during your childhood. Uh, one of those, for example, is did you have a parent who suffered from alcoholism? Did you uh, experience violence when you were a child? Did you witness violence when you were a child? Did you have a parent who suffered from mental illness? Uh, you know, were you sexually assaulted when you were a child? There are all these different things that can happen. Some of the ones that they're missing are, you know, did you have major surgeries when you were a child? Were you part of you know a, a war zone when you were a child were you in a society that was at war in a way that that directly affected you when you were a child so there's a lot like i said there's a lot of those questions that are missing anyway um what i discovered uh when i uh when i was reading the body keeps the score is that um uh, i read a statistic and it says that uh, a person with, I think it's specifically a woman in this statistic, I believe, said that a woman with an ACE score of zero, meaning that uh, she does not have any of the uh, any of the questions that are on the ACE test, she has not had any of those adverse childhood experiences, she has a 5% chance of experiencing rape or sexual assault as an adult. Um, a woman who scores a four or higher on the ACE test, which mine is about a four or a five, um, has a 33% chance of being raped or sexually assaulted as an adult. And I read that and I suddenly thought, huh, I think there has been something about this narrative of victim blaming that, uh, that has been kept from me. I think there is something about this narrative that, um, you know, we are we are advocating so hard for survivors to not be blamed in society you know by for example there's so much victim blaming that happens by uh by the police by the legal system you know you know you go and report a rape and and they say well where were you and what were you wearing and were you drunk and all this other stuff you know whether um whether it's our legal system or whether it's just even society the way that people react to it on the internet the way that sometimes even your friends or family may react and of course um, they may be well-intentioned or they may not but nonetheless it comes back with this with this feeling of like well if you hadn't done this then you know you wouldn't have been attacked you know and uh, and we know that's not true because we know that sexual assaults and rapes can happen anywhere to anyone um, regardless, uh, regardless of, of their circumstances, you could just be walking down the street, minding your own business and, and get attacked. You know, you could be with someone that you believe that you really trust. Most rapes actually happen from people that the survivor knows is acquainted with. You could be with someone that you thought was trustworthy, uh, and then you find out they're not because they end up sexually assaulting you. Um, so, so, um, so where I made uh, this distinction for myself uh, is, is I, I work with this metaphor and this metaphor essentially is that if someone comes along and vandalizes my house, it is not my fault, it is not my house's fault that my house was vandalized. That lies 100% on the fault of the person who did the vandalism. And especially when it comes to the legal system, we should not be looking for any fault whatsoever in someone who is a victim of a crime. That's, that's just ridiculous. There is nothing about anyone's behavior that should ever invite an assault or invite a rape. You're just the house that's standing on the side of the road and someone comes along and vandalizes you. That is 100% not your fault. And yet, for me, the way that I finally started to put things together and address my circumstances was I started to look at this metaphor um, and also realize that even though it's not my fault that someone came along and vandalized my house, no one's gonna clean up my house for me but myself. Even in the metaphor, <laughs> even in the metaphor, if we, if we go with vandalism, 
Um, that person who vandalized your house, even if the cops do catch them, even if it's brought to trial and even if they're convicted, that person's probably just going to face a fine that goes to the city, by the way, not to you and your healing, right? This is why our legal system is not set up for anything resembling restorative or transformative justice whatsoever. That fine's going to go to the city and, you know, they might do a weekend in jail or something along those lines, but none of that helps you clean up your house. Cleaning up your house is actually on you. And um, that's not fair, but I would rather clean up my house than I would sit around in a house that's been vandalized and wait for the world to be fair and clean up my house for me. That's my personal choice. It's the thing that has worked most effectively for me. Um, and what I have found as well is that, you know, there's a theory from... I believe it's from the book Freakonomics, and it's called Broken Windows Theory. Now, Broken Windows Theory, that when it is um, in practice, um, you know, when it's applied practically uh, uh, by our government to enforce higher levels of law enforcement in uh, in neighborhoods that uh, that are impoverished, I believe it's incredibly racist and incredibly classist, and it's not something that should be used for governing. So here, I'm using it just as a metaphor, just FYI. Um, broken windows theory essentially says that if you have a building where the windows are already broken, then it is more likely that more people will come along and break more windows or break in and steal from that building or vandalize it, et cetera, et cetera. If they're in a nicer neighborhood where all the windows are intact and everything looks fine, then no one's, it's much less likely that someone who wants to burglarize a place is going to go into a place that looks like it has a high security system or or that you know that that isn't already damaged if it's already been damaged then someone is going to uh going to say well if, if i if someone else damaged that i can go in and damage it too and there there won't be any repercussions apparently um, that seems to be the crux behind broken windows theory so when i discovered the statistic regarding the ace test and how High, the, the correlation between a high score on the ACE test and, um, and one's likelihood of experiencing rape or assault, I, um, I immediately thought of broken windows theory. And I immediately thought, I wonder if um, my trauma response, for example, we can get into trauma responses. Um, your trauma responses will compromise your discernment because uh, undergoing trauma tends to result in one of two uh, po possible polarities of response and any number of hybrids in between. Those polarities are desensitization and hyperarousal. Desensitization means it's very hard for your body to feel things because it shut off its ability to feel because in your moments of trauma, especially with complex PTSD where something may have happened to you many times over as it did with me, it shuts off your body's ability to feel things, to feel sensations, or even to feel, uh, you know, like whether you can trust someone, whether you can discern red flags, uh, which, because essentially that's, that ends up being kind of the same thing because in the moment it's shutting off your ability to feel because it wants you to be able to survive. And in order to, to survive something that's so horrible that you don't want to feel it, your body shuts it off for you in order to protect you. Unfortunately, we sometimes have to be very proactive about turning that switch back on after the trauma has passed. The other polarity is hyperarousal, and hyperarousal means you are feeling things at an ex incredibly, uh, uh, this is where we get like, you know, PTSD flashbacks, you know, like veterans who, if um, fireworks go off, all of a sudden they're back in the trenches, you know, hearing gunshots or, or what have you. So hyperarousal is about feeling that, uh, that that moment of being in your trauma, um, sometimes at all times or at times that you can't necessarily discern. Either way, either way, whether you experience desensitization, hyperarousal, or a combination of those two, what that does is it compromises your ability to feel things. It compromises your ability to be in the present moment and feel whether something is hurting you or not because either you can't feel anything or everything feels like it hurts anyway. So this makes it extremely difficult to be able to trust your own judgment. And when you can't trust your own judgment, it's very difficult for you to set boundaries and it's very difficult to get out of a situation where, uh, where your boundaries are being crossed. And for me, I was in a lot of situations where my boundaries were being crossed and I didn't know how to get out of it. 
So there's a lot of mechanisms that go into that, but ultimately, ultimately I had to, ultimately in order to get to the place that I am now, which is a year and a half sexual assault free, I had to really take a look at cleaning up my own house from the vandalism that had occurred to it so that I could live in my house, first of all, because when your house has been vandalized and broken into, you don't really want to be there. Um, when there's so much energetic, emotional clutter in your body that you're not dealing with, you don't want to be mindful, you don't want to be in your experience, right? So it's necessary to, to, it's necessary to clean up your house so that you can live in it and feel safe and comfortable in it. So you can be in your body and you can start to feel things again. I hope this is all making sense. When I decided to clean up all of my emotional clutter, all the repressed trauma that I had in me that I was essentially hoarding, I moved that out of my body so that my spirit could move back into my body. By spirit, I mean my conscious awareness so that I could start to resensitize, so that I could start to feel things again in a way that was commensurate with the experiences that I was having so that I could be present. And even though it is not at all my fault for having been sexually assaulted in the past, I now have the tools of discernment to know when something is happening that is crossing a boundary for me and to the best of my ability to be able to say no to that experience by either removing myself from the environment um, by stating a stronger boundary rather than, you know, freezing or fawning or dissociating, which are many things that people do when they are, are being traumatized that are not their fault, that are biological responses. But I'm now better and better able to, um, to, to really use my, my presence and my, uh, my embodiment to know when a boundary is being crossed. Uh, and this is really difficult because when I say that I now know um, how to get myself out of those situations, it implies that everyone else can do it too. And I know that that's a difficult thing to tackle um, because if it, if it implies that everyone else can do it too, then that's going to lead to more victim blaming and more people saying, well, why didn't you get out of there? And why didn't you, um, you know, why didn't you discern better? Um, so all that I will say about that is that that's a long process and it took me many years. And if you were someone who grew up with adverse childhood experiences to begin with, you, that, that you couldn't obviously as until you're 18 years old, you're not even legally allowed to, to, to live on your own. You're essentially the property of your parents. So what happens is that as all of those traumatic experiences are building up in you, you don't get the chance when you're a child to discern for yourself. I certainly didn't. I tried to legally emancipate myself from my abusive father and I failed. So there I was having a ton of trauma build up and repressed in me when I was a child and then going out into the world as an adult and again, carrying all of that repressed trauma in me, all of that desensitization and dissociation, all of those trauma responses that made it difficult for me to discern. So in many ways, it is not your fault, in all ways, it is not your fault at all. If you're not capable of discerning um, or, or removing yourself from, you know, of setting boundaries or, or removing yourself from situations that are causing you to feel bad. Not all of us are empowered to do that. And I get it. I absolutely get it because I have been stuck in that place for, for years at a time and I don't blame myself whatsoever. So I'm very cautious about this rhetoric because, because I recognize that teaching people discernment, teaching people to resensitize and be able to embody and be able to set better boundaries for themselves and maybe get themselves back to that place where they only have that 5% chance of experiencing assault rather than the 33% chance that they have if they're carrying around all of that energetic trauma that starts in childhood and just builds and builds and builds until we get to a place where we release it and we're free of it. Um, that was such a long sentence, I forget where I started with it, but basically I understand, um, I understand why this is a touchy subject. So I can only say from my own experience, um, I can only say from my own experience that, uh, that this has worked for me. And, uh, and I don't want to, as I said, I don't want to rob other people of the experience to, uh, to heal themselves 
to the point where um, where they maybe go back to that five percent statistic as well, um, rather than um, rather than being desensitized or hyper aroused to the point where um, where they are are less able to uh, to discern the circumstances that are are leading to to dangerous outcomes for them. That's absolutely where I was when I was desensitized, and uh, and I hope that I can articulate it without implying whatsoever um, any fault on the part of victims and or survivors because at the end of the day um, nothing that you do invites that nothing that you do invites um, someone crossing your boundaries without your consent and we need to teach the people who are boundary crossers that it is their responsibility uh, to ask for consent in the first place we need to uh, inform them of uh, uh, of ways of having better and clearer understandings of boundaries themselves. That's where the real work needs to be done, uh, especially when it comes to the legal system, to law enforcement, and to the way that stigma around rape and assault is viewed in society. Absolutely, there is nothing, I, 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 would, I, would, I would not be able to, I would, I would not be able to live with myself if, I, if, if in any way this work reinforced that stigma because um, it is so important that perpetrators take full responsibility for their actions. And again, if your house is on the side of the road, you absolutely did not ask uh, for that house to just come up and be vandalized. There's nothing about your house that was asking for it. Um, <laughs> but, um, but again, um, when I read those statistics, I really thought there was something that was missing from the narrative. And since I've made that change in myself, um, I want to give those tools uh, to others as well. So, um, so the, those this video is really long already, um, but uh, but essentially um, divesting ourselves of our energetic, um, emotional, uh, repressed trauma, uh, being able to reset our patterns, being able to feel things again, being able to learn discernment so that we do know um, on some level who uh, what kind of people uh, feel good to us, what kind of people. Um, we can uh, we can trust with ourselves and that if we make a mistake and we trust someone that we shouldn't trust um, or we encounter someone that we don't trust or something happens to us that hopefully in uh, in more and more of those instances we are able to immediately know in the situation that something is crossing our boundaries and to remove ourselves from it if possible and again there are no guarantees and even as I said even those women who score a zero on the ACE test still have that five percent chance so it is possible that you could just be walking down the street and there is nothing that you could have possibly done to have prevented it. And of course, in those cases, you know, that, that, is, that is something that we ab absolutely have to acknowledge as reality. But if I can, can put these tools out there and give this viewpoint to someone and it helps them in, uh, in, in getting their life to a better place where they are no longer uh, experiencing uh, that kind of boundary crossing in the way that I have done for myself, then it will have been worth it. So I hope this was helpful. Thank you for listening. Um, I, as you can tell, I was super, super cautious about my wording in this video. So if you've made it this far, thank you for listening. And I, I hope it made you feel good. And I hope it, I hope it gives you some hope for, uh, for the future um, in calling, uh, in, in your ability to, uh, to call your power back and, uh, and to heal from everything that has happened to you and to be able to uh, reset yourself. So thank you.